I talk to a lot of clinicians that are trying leaving this insurance-based healthcare system. They're going to what's known as, of course, direct primary care, where patients pay a set fee. It could be like a hundred dollars a month, where they can get access to these physicians. And um, I get a sense that these physicians are are much happier. They don't have to deal with things like that, like the bureaucracy and the paperwork. They can spend. Uh, you know, 45 minutes to an hour with these patients, they see fewer patients. So yes, I am seeing a, a trend towards more physicians getting out of the insurance-based healthcare system. All right, guys, welcome back to the Medical Entrepreneur Podcast. I have a special guest on. You might know him, very famous, Kevin MD. Adam, thank you so much for having me on the show. Uh, my name is Kevin Poe. I'm the founder of Kevin MD. I'm an internal medicine physician. I still practice primary care. I'm based in Nashua, New Hampshire, and I've been running Kevin MD since 2004. And it's a platform where anybody in healthcare can really share their story so they can be heard. And it's led me in so many different directions, which we'll talk about today. I know that one of the things I'm always impressed about uh, from from you is just like the ability that you have to to talk to so many people. I mean, you do a podcast every day of the week. That's incredible. It's uh, it's definitely a learning experience. I think one of the things that I was so surprised. I started this right a few months after the pandemic, back in June, and I thought, man, this is a great opportunity to talk to a lot of the Kevin MD authors, talk to the guest authors, so they can share their stories in their own words. And I remember throwing open my schedule three months in advance. I said, nah, who's going to sign up for the podcast? And I think within five days, I had like 90 slots filled up. So you know that I was committed. There's no backing up now. I had to go through 90 interviews in three wow. months. And I thought to myself, oh my gosh, what did I get myself into? I, I, I've never done a podcast before. I'm not a skilled interviewer. I was just starting for the first time. But I had 90 of these to do. So um, it was definitely a trial by fire experience. But it, it, it's been so rewarding because I've met so many people. It's wonderful to talk to them in person. And it's 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 been a tremendous learning opportunity for me because I get to talk to experts in pretty much every field of medicine across the country. I have about twenty minutes of their undivided attention, and I can ask them anything I want, right? So it's really been a lot of fun, and I've learned a tremendous amount. It's been it's been great. Well, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about kind of how you started. I mean, you mentioned you were doing internal medicine, but maybe you could tell us, you know, what brought you into medicine. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, kind of the journey that you had. Uh, you know, obviously becoming a physician. You know, what, what was the impetus for you to, to, to kind of step out? You know, because yeah. so, so often in medicine, you know, we're taught, you know, be conservative, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. So like in terms of going medicine, right, it's the cliche response. You know, how can you make the best difference in people's lives? You know, how can I use my skills and my interests and my passion to make a difference in, in the world? You know, how can I make my mark in the world, right? So going to medicine, people are always coming to you. They're in their most vulnerable state. No one likes to come to the doctor and they share stories and they tell you things that they wouldn't tell anywhere else. They'll disrobe for you and, you know, examine them. And like, you know, these are things that, that don't happen under normal circumstances. So the amount of trust that patients place in their clinicians, I think to me was, was truly fascinating. And to be able to um, listen to their story, guide them through what a lot of times are the most difficult times in their lives, that to me is very rewarding and still is rewarding. I still practice primary care two and a half days a week despite everything else. Back in 2004, I started a blog, Kevin MD, and I thought it was a wonderful opportunity where I can not only talk to patients one to one in the exam room, but also one to many on what was an early social media platform. And uh, I tell the story a lot where I think I wrote a blog post after a drug recall, and then the next day someone came up to me and or one of my patients in the exam room said, you know, I read your blog post this morning and I was comfortable with what you had to say. And that to me was kind of my aha moment in terms of reaching patients outside the exam room. And now, of course, we're talking about 20 something years later. It's so much more important because patients now are just getting so much information online and we just live through or we're still living through three plus years of the pandemic and there's still a lot of misinformation out there. There's still a lot of polarization out there. So I think it's certainly more important for physicians or clinicians and anyone in the healthcare field to get out there and guide patients to reputable sources of healthcare information. And there's so many threats, of course, to our profession as well. It's so important for us to get our voices heard and not only make differences in patients' lives, but also differences in our own lives as well. Wow. That's a really... Um that makes some really good points. And then I was going to say, like, with regards to patient care, I mean, I don't, what I've kind of seen in, in kind of things that we talk about in medical entrepreneur podcast is like, 
a lot of the people that we're talking to are, are basically disenfranchised people in medicine. You know, they've, they've done, you know, when you, when you go through the training, you think, oh, I'm going to get out. I'm going to help so many people. I'm going to do this. And then you get out and you realize like you're burdened under a system that essentially is algorithm driven. The insurance company will only pay for certain things, even if it's not necessarily in the best interest of the patient. Um, have you seen your practice change over the years? And, and if so, like, have you taken any steps to, to, you know, to, to be able to practice the way that you want to? Yeah, it's exactly what you said. I think that a lot of people going to medicine, they, they go in with that idealistic mindset, but then come out and see what our healthcare system is. And there's so many things that are wrong with our healthcare system that could be improved. And I think that letdown, the disappointment is leading to a lot of clinician burnout, right? We know the statistics, 60% of uh, clinicians are burnt out or feeling burnt out. I think medicine isn't quite what they expected. And I think the the biggest reason, as you said, is that loss of autonomy, right? I think clinicians are being told what to do. They, they can't practice the way they want. They're being told that they have to stick with these algorithms. They have to do prior authorizations before they order tests and, and, and prescribe medications. And I think there's a lot of disappointment where the expectation of what they thought medicine would be isn't quite... Um, meeting or the reality of medicine isn't quite meeting what their expectation of medicine um, is. And um, I certainly see that a lot in, in primary care, of course, where I'm seeing more and more bureaucracy and we have to deal with these clunky electronic medical record systems. And of course, you know, you're, you're on a phone with, with people arguing about prior authorization. So it is a little bit disenfranchising and sometimes that loss of autonomy, um, makes, you know, it makes practicing medicine much more difficult. But then if you think it's difficult for us, then you have to look at it from the patient's standpoint. And I think um, we have to realize that as hard as we have it, patients have it worse because for them to navigate through this maze of, of, of bureaucracy that they have to face whenever they go for, for health care, I think that it's even worse for patients. And that's why we have to, to stick with it because if patients don't have clinicians to guide them, they don't have a lot of chance when it comes to navigating their healthcare system themselves. Oh, that's so true. Is there anything that um, you've done? Like, you know, our practice, we always try to, to tell people to get kind of a, not where they're not dependent on insurance-based medicine, you know, because with insurance-based medicine, so many things could go wrong. Yeah. Even I've seen to the point where here in Texas, Blue Cross Blue Shield actually had a, um, a, a wholly owned subsidiary file medical board complaints against primary care physicians who had prescribed expensive drugs as wow. they defined expensive. Uh, and then these board guys had to go up and defend a medical board complaint, which at the minimum is like five grand in legal cost, you know. Wow. Um, and just basically just Blue Cross essentially punishing these guys for, for prescribing medications that they, they can't control the price over. Yeah, so I, I talked to a lot of clinicians that are trying to leaving this insurance-based healthcare system. They're going to what's known as, of course, direct primary care where patients pay a set fee. It could be like $100 a month where they can get access to these physicians. And um, I get a sense that these physicians are, are much happier. They don't have to deal with things like that, like the bureaucracy and the paperwork. They can spend uh, you know 45 minutes to an hour with each patient. They see fewer patients. So yes, I am seeing a, a trend towards more physicians getting out of the insurance-based healthcare system. Do you have any any of your own, like I know you mentioned you're practicing two days a week. Is that just to keep up your license or is that just something that's like a passion project or, you know? Yeah, so I practice two and a half days a week. And I think the biggest reason is that there's such a shortage of primary care clinicians. And the bottom line is that patients need us, right? Because yeah, I'm not sure what the, what the situation is in Texas, but up here in New Hampshire, you know, some of you have to wait whatever months, right, for, for patients to get in to see a, a primary care clinician. So part of it is I, 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 I'm needed. Um, second is that um, I do enjoy the medicine aspects of it, right? So I'm not sure about practicing primary care five days a week. I think that would be, that would be very, very difficult. But the medicine aspect of it, still I get a lot of reward and talking to patients about the various issues and problems that, that they have and trying to solve some of these issues and just, again, guiding them through the healthcare system whenever they get diagnosed with a complex disease. Um, and then also from a more personal standpoint, whenever I'm talking to physicians about things like social media and why they should get on, I think that I have a little bit more credibility that I'm a practicing physician myself, right? So if I'm talking to primary care physicians about why they should get involved with social media, why they perhaps need to go on, you know, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, you know, I'm not 
someone who's who's not going through what they are going, right? Because I've actually lived through it. I've done it myself. And that to me is a little bit more persuasive whenever I talk to other clinicians. So um, I think that that blend of what I do with Kevin MD and on the website, I speak, doing the podcast, and I go on other podcasts like like I am now, that to me has been a, is a fantastic counterbalance to, to what I do clinically in primary care. And um, one of the themes that I'm sure we're going to mention later is that our degrees, our, our degrees, our lives is what you make of it. We are certainly more than our degrees. And I think that there's so many opportunities for clinicians out there to make their professional lives the way they want. Um, gone are the days where physicians are only this. They're, they, they only are going to the hospital. They're only surgery. They only go to the clinic. Um, I think now we have just so many opportunities that are available to us that the definition of what being a clinician is is just so varied and vast. And there's just so many opportunities out there that we have so much flexibility in terms of choosing how our professional life is. Man, that's a really great. I, mean, I think it's a really great thing. I know uh, one somebody actually referred to you as the the Gary Vaynerchuk of medical social media. Well, <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if I have the cachet of Gary V. Um, but uh, you know, certainly that you know that's a, that's a that's a compliment. Um, and <laughs> uh, I think right. <laughs> but uh, like I said, I think that it, I try to to, like I said earlier, make a difference um, in terms of improving the lives of clinicians, getting our voices out there. And again, it's being re- re- very rewarding in terms of seeing the impact of that. I just see kind of this this lack of information and, and education that's out there, uh, especially for, I mean, even, even for example, like you take an average GI doctor, right? You know, most of the time they're spending most of their days doing scopes, yeah. you know, all day. And, and maybe they have clinic, you know, twice a week, that kind of thing. Um, and so for somebody like that, um, who's out there and said, you know, how can I make a difference? Yeah. Um, what would, uh, what would, <laughs> what would take Gary Vaynerchuk of, uh, of medical social media tell him? Yeah. So they have to ask themselves, are they happy with what they're doing? Right. So, you know, we always talk about physicians, you know, looking, you know, looking for a side gig and looking for things outside of clinical medicine. Now, I think that discounts a lot of physicians who are perfectly happy doing what they're doing. So the first thing I would say to that GI doc is, are you happy doing what you're doing? Right. And they may say, yes, I am perfectly happy doing scopes and, you know, my, my, my life is great. And, and, and I, I don't really want to be involved with things like social media because what I'm doing is perfectly rewarding, fulfilling, and I'm not burnt out, right? So for those physicians, then I probably don't have too much to say for them. But I would say that more than 50% of physicians, like I said, the data is like 60% of physicians are experiencing symptoms of burnout, right? So the question then becomes, you know, what can I do about it, right? Should I stick with this job that's leading me to be burnt out and perhaps being less empathetic to patients and you know, my patient care is suffering because I am burnt out, right? So then the question, and you know, what, what can I do, right? So then I think that um, you have to find a cause, and the cause in a majority of cases is that lack of empowerment, right? So you need to um, find a way to become more empowered in terms of your professional career. For me, of course, is having what I do with Kevin MD and it does supplement my income. It allows me to cut back down to two and a half days a week. So some of the downsides of practicing primary care is limited because I'm only practicing two and a half days a week. So talking to a GI doc, if, if they find that they're being burnt out by the productivity pressures and whatever is burning them out for medicine, I would probably say, you know, cut down and find something that fills their cup up again, right? It doesn't have to be social media, right? It could be writing, it could be investing, it could be real estate, starting a business, you know, whatever fills your passion up because I think it's so important to have that balance. And like I said, as physicians, we do have opportunities that are out there outside of clinical medicine. Because, you know, for a lot of physicians, I don't, you know, you, you, we have the typical role or in, in your mind, you have the idea of like maybe like an influencer on Instagram, you know, who who lives kind of this uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe say like fancy life, if you will, where they, they, and they're they like, oh, I'm wearing this, I'm going to this this place, I'm eating at this restaurant. Could you maybe describe like what you would foresee a, a physician who is participating in social media, kind of like yourself, like well, how they, what it might look like for them to be yeah. an influencer. So I think they have to go in with, with what their goals are, right? So I think going to social media to be an influencer or going into social media for the sake of social media probably isn't a good idea. They have to go in with pre, with a, with a specific goal in mind, right? So what do they want to accomplish by being a social media, being in social media? Because it's not easy 
it's a grind. It, it, it for me, I spend more time on social media and do my podcast than I do practicing clinical medicine. So it, it, you know, for some people looking at my work day may feel like you know that's a lot of work, right? That, that, that it, it, it's a big grind. So in general, the main reasons why people want to go into social media would be number one is to educate patients. We talked about this earlier in terms of guiding patients to reputable sources of healthcare information and increasing the ratio when it comes to reputable versus unreputable sources of healthcare information. So that's, I think, one of the strongest reasons why more of us need to be online to kind of make that a more favorable ratio. Uh, number two is advocate for our profession and allow clinicians to share their stories, talking to people uh, who may not be clinicians and they make medical decisions on behalf of us. You know, we're talking things like politicians or physicians who don't practice anymore yet are involved with policy. So I think it's important to influence them. Or it could be something as simple as maintaining our online reputation. A lot of patients, they Google us online, and if we're not involved with cr proactively creating our content online, then we're going to be defined by someone else, right? It could be a third-party physician rating site. So I think being involved in creating content can help us take control of our online reputation. But no matter what the reason is, you have to come in with a preconceived reason and then... And then adapt social media to fit those goals. Um, in terms of, you know, the life of an influencer, like I said, it, it is a grind. It, it's, a, it's a constant pressure, right? You know, some people say it's, it's, uh, it's, um, it's very difficult every day to have that pressure of, of creating content. Content creators, they themselves are burnt out just because of that constant need to feed that monster that always requires content, right? So, you know, whether it's Instagram or, or YouTube, you have to do it regularly. You know, it could be da a daily podcast like me. It could be several times a week, it could be several times a month. But the fact that it has to be regular, that in itself is a pressure. Not everyone's really equipped for that. But I think that if you have a goal that speaks to you, that you're passionate about, that makes that social media content creation grind much more easier. Wow, that's a really good point. Um, one of the things I was so impressed with was just the sheer volume of people you've talked to. I mean, just because you have a podcast, I, I can only imagine what your schedule is like to produce seven podcasts a week is incredible. But just just the sheer volume and all the things that you've you've done. Um, were there any things that that perhaps like some of your podcasts that you felt like were really, you know, like, oh, that's that, that that's that's an idea that changed my life, you know, that kind of thing. So I've talked to. So we're closing in on a thousand episodes, right? So as we're doing this almost uh, two and a half, three years. On Kevin MD, we have like six to seven thousand guest authors, and you know I've learned just so much uh, from them in terms of uh, you know just the clinical things. You know I always stay up to date in terms of you know whatever clinical topics. Um, I think the biggest impression I had is that even going into it. There's just so many things more we can do with our, our degrees, right? I've talked to physicians who turned into real estate investors. I've talked to physicians who became venture capitalists. I've talked about, I talked to a physician who actually quit medicine and became a high school science teacher, right? So I think that the path that we take, like I said, is so nonlinear now. And that to me was the biggest impression that I got just talking to so many other clinicians who are out there is that it's it's just we just have so many options in terms of where to take our degree and and just because you know if we're not happy with what we're doing in clinical medicine we have options right so that that's really certainly the point of of this podcast that we have options um, with our degree other than what's making us unhappy in clinical medicine. Oh, well, that's that's very true. Um, I just think it's very impressive everything that you've built and then. Uh, you know, one of the things that you kind of mentioned earlier, I just want to touch back on because yeah. I, I've seen this more and more with my colleagues is that you, you might have seen like the the suicide rate for physicians is so high, yeah. you know. Um, and uh, the thing is that it's kind of unmeasured even with uh, nurse practitioners, CRNAs and other, you know, other uh, divisions of medicine. Like they don't actually, it doesn't seem like they have any data on it. And so I imagine it's probably the same for them. So we have basically a whole workforce uh, in medicine that essentially is not, not only burned out, but it's to the point where... I saw a statistic saying that if like 80% of physicians would leave medicine, if they had a financial uh, income that could, could be a, a, a similar to what they were earning in medicine. Yeah. For those people that, that are like that, that are, are dealing with burnout, um, they're dealing with, you know, kind of this, 
this feeling that like they're kind of losing ground. Um, just to give you an example, like one of the colleagues I talked to, um, he's a, actually a primary care physician who also does sports medicine. And he was saying that, you know, in the last three years, he's worked harder than he's ever worked. He's made less money than he's ever made. Uh, and yet the, the amount of stress and the bureaucracy and stuff is higher than ever before. For someone like that, um, is there anything that you would, uh, I, I, you, you would recommend or any, any pathways that maybe you've seen from some of your guests that might be applicable for, for somebody that's stuck in that situation? Yeah, so I think that you just hit the nail on the head in terms of one of the biggest reasons why physicians can be burned out is because they have to stay in medicine because of financial reasons, right? It could be, you know, whatever, school loans or, you know, they, they bought too expensive a house, you know, expensive cars. They had to live that proverbial doctor lifestyle and kind of live beyond their means, right? And then now they're stuck in their jobs because they can't quit because they got to pay the bills, right? So I think in order for us to be more than our degrees and do things outside of clinical medicine, you have to be independently, um, you have to be financially independent, right? So you need to, number one, of course, is you have to pay off your debts um, and then you have to find... Uh, some way to supplement your income so you're not reliant on, you know, what we call our W-2 income, right, our, our doctor income. So if you have um, some type of income source, if you could diversify your income, put in some 1099 income in addition to your W-2 income so you're less reliant on it, that to me is is the, the surest path out of burnout. Once you can cut down, once you have the financial flexibility to see patients only two days a week, then I think your burnout will lessen because whatever is causing you to be burned out, you're just doing less of. And then you're doing more of something you're more passionate in. Um, and the first step to that is, of course, is you have to pay off your debt, right? So whether it's student loans, whether it's a mortgage, once you pay that off, you're going to find that you're going to have more financial flexibility to do something that you truly love doing. Well, that's awesome. Like I know, for example, like I remember when I first went into medicine, some of the doctors that were already physicians at the time would tell me, you know, hey, don't go into medicine. It's not what it used to be. You know, and I was just like, oh, yeah, sure. That's what you say. Like, it looks like you're doing good. You know, these days with the changes that medicine has hap have happened to medicine and even I would say almost more, I guess, like uh, some of the, the punishments for for even having a different viewpoint. Like, you know, we saw this during COVID. If a physician yeah. felt like, you know, hey, I want to treat a patient with budesonide or something, you know, like, you know, some of those some of those doctors lost their job for speaking out or, or trying medications, you know, you know, in an emergency situation that. It wasn't uh, with the, you know, po popular narrative or whatever. Um, what would you say to somebody who is is looking at going into medicine? They haven't pulled the trigger yet. They think they want to be a doctor. They think they want to help people. What would be your advice to, to like a young man or woman that is interested in becoming a physician or a nurse practitioner, something like this? Yeah, you have to do it for the right reason, right? So it can never, ever be for money. It can never, ever be for lifestyle because you're going to be working harder than your peers, you're going to be sleeping less than your peers, you're going to be dealing with more bureaucracy than your peers, and in a lot of cases, you're going to be paid less, right? So, you know, the training is, is tremendously rigorous. It's, it's, it's it, you know, going through residency is not easy. And then even when you get out of residency, like you said, it's going to be probably not what you expect it to be. It's not like you're going to be graduating residency and all of a sudden you're going to have, you know, the riches come to you and, and live that extravagant lifestyle. That's simply not the case. So you have to go into it with the right reason. And you do, you know, it, it sounds like a cliche. You really have to do it to help people, right? You have to do it because you want to take care of people who are probably going through a more difficult time than you are. And that would be my biggest piece of advice. Do not go into medicine for the lifestyle or money. Go for it because you truly want to help people. And, you know, I know that you know, I wish I had a more interesting answer to that, but uh, it's the truth. <laughs> well, that's really good. Um, what do you think about, like, in terms of, like, our healthcare system in the United States? It's obviously changed a lot, and I, I feel like the insurance companies are, are becoming so powerful now yeah. as, as they continue to consolidate. Is there anything that you've seen from, from your guest or even from your own experience where – is there, if you, if I could give, you know, if I could give you, get Kevin MD a wand and say, hey, you can make, remake the healthcare system however you want to, what would be kind of an ideal scenario that you think would be uh, good for the healthcare system? Yeah, and, that's kind of a huge question, yeah. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> so I think that, uh, I think smarter minds than mine have certainly tried to tackle that question. I think that there's just so much inertia in terms of what we have already with our healthcare system, right? It's, we have this employer-based healthcare insurance, um, all you know, right, Medicare, Medicaid, we have private insurers, right? So I think it's very difficult. There's just so many entrenched interests in our healthcare system. So 
those who say, oh, we should just scrap it all and do a, you know, something like a single pair, single pair healthcare system, you know, I think that realistically would be difficult. I think that sometimes if you start from scratch, that certainly would be one option, but we're not starting from scratch. We're starting from an area where we literally have billions to trillions of dollars entrenched in the current system that we have. So there's going to be a lot of resistance to any major change. Um, so then you have to look at other countries that have our similar values and have similar kind of a similar basis for healthcare. So, you know, you can look at countries like Switzerland that have private insurers that are highly regulated. That's what the Affordable Care Act try to do, try to, you know, better regulate private insurance. So that's certainly one option. Um, you know, another consideration is to have um, basic government provided healthcare insurance. You know, sometimes some people say Medicaid for all perhaps or Medicare for all, you know, to have some type of basic healthcare insurance and then people who want can pay more and get some private insurance on top of that. Um, I like Australia's healthcare system where Australia, for instance, they have government provided baseline healthcare insurance. But if you want, um, you know, to skip the line and if you want something on top of that, then you can have private, private um, health insurance on top of that. Uh, but I think, I do think that we do need at least some universal basic health care insurance for everybody in this country. Um, that needs to be the start. I know the Affordable Care Act tried to do that, but we still have tens of millions of people who are without uh, insurance. So finding a way to cover those and then um, better regulating the private insurers and trying to improve what we already have probably would be the more real, most realistic way going forward. I was curious to see what your take is on, um, you know, patients' rights and kind of like, you know, with the whole COVID thing, there's a kind of a whole concept where basically like, hey, you know, there's a pandemic. So now, you know, everybody needs to have this, you know, uh, medical procedure. Um, and, you know, the question kind of came down between like, is it your right to not have a medical procedure? Uh, just from your experience and this maybe some of the people you've interviewed, um, where do you kind of see that that, you know, I kind of see that line is starting to, to fade where, you know, it's coming to a point where, you know, many cases, if they have like a digital passport, this kind of stuff, you may not have the option to choose anymore. So tell me more about, the, yeah, tell me more about the digital passport. Well, from what we see is that uh, basically, I believe it's the G20 nations have uh, now put into place a uh, kind of proposal that would include a, a digital passport, which would basically require your vaccinations to be linked to this digital passport. Uh, and that in order for you to travel, uh, the thought is that basically in order for you to travel or be accepted into a country that they would review your digital passport and say, hey, you, you know, you need to have these these kind of treatments in order to come in, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't think it's going to fly very well in this country. Right. So I think that, um, <laughs> you know, I think that it goes through the culture as well. I think um, you, it's probably not controversial to say that in the United States that we have a very individualistic culture and that starts all throughout history because our country was born of revolution, right? Our, our country is not born of, of compliance or, or, you know, kind of a, a central government, right? We were born out of revolution. So I think that culture of individualism kind of um, is very, very strong today. So, you know, from a public health standpoint, you know, some may say that, may make sense but i think realistically if you look at the culture of america um i, I don't think that's going to convince uh, a majority of people that they want to do that right so we have things like privacy concerns and, and 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 things like that um in general i do think that when it comes to diagnostic and treatment plans i do think that patients do have the final say of course there are some exceptions when it comes to um, societal benefits and things that are blatantly wrong and that will hurt patients themselves you know those are exceptions but in general when it comes to um, treatment options we have various options that we can give to a lot of patients right and you have to take into account patients individual values when it comes to considering what they want to do next because one patient may want to be more aggressive and others may want to be more conservative so i always try to engage patients and give them a menu of options ranging from conservative to aggressive and that way patients can include their own values when it comes to guiding the treatment plan so yes in general i do think that patients do have a final say I'm, i am a believer in patients rights um and specific to that digital passport that you mentioned um i don't think it's a realistic path forward especially in this country well, I, I totally agree. I mean, I'm, I'm from, I'm from Texas. People here are very, very individualistic and, you know, everybody has the beliefs that they have the right. And I just, um, I was just curious to see, like, based on everything, cause I do see other physician voices that are, are coming out. They're saying, Hey, you know, this is, 
you, know, you, you need to do this, it's, you know, for the public good and like, you know, et cetera. So I was just curious to see, like, from all the information you saw, you know, kind of your opinion. Yeah, and, and you're um, seeing something like that play out right now, even with, with COVID, right? You're seeing, you know, what's good for public health, but, you know, you're that's clashing with, again, you know, what's good for um, your, let me see, let me, let me rephrase that. You're seeing um, that tension between individual rights versus public health, right? And you're seeing that still play out today. So that is certainly going to be an uh, ongoing tension. We do live in a polarized country, uh, polarized society. So I think that that's just another ramification of that. That's very true. And then I was just curious, like, um, you know, you treat patients uh, two and a half days a week. What do you think is like, uh, you know, obviously you're very well-spoken. I, I can see exactly why patients would love to talk to you. You're obviously highly educated. Is there any um, examples that you might give of, you know, a time where you were able to use the power of your social media to to either identify a patient who may not have normally come in to see you, or perhaps you're able to point to one of your podcast episodes to help a patient like become more educated? Um, just maybe an example of how the social media actually helped a patient interaction. Yeah, so I think that there are some patients who come to me because they listen to my podcast or they found me on social media and and we will have a conversation. You know, some patients would say, you know, I don't agree with what this doctor said about the COVID vaccine, right? And the fact they come into me and even if I don't agree with what their personal values are about COVID, about the COVID vaccine, they're willing to come in for a conversation based on what they saw on my blog or listened to on my podcast. So it's given an opportunity where we could actually have that, that conversation and, um, you know, good back and forth. We're not arguing with each other. I can certainly share my opinion and that person would be very receptive and, and he or she will give their opinion and, and, uh, it's led to a constructive conversation. Now, have I convinced every single patient to see things my way or convince them to get a vaccine that they otherwise wouldn't have? No, of course not. It's never a hundred percent, but I have made a few patients reconsider, for instance, taking the COVID vaccine or doing or considering a, a treatment that they otherwise wouldn't have. And really that's the best result that I can expect because as physicians, you know, we can't expect to convince 100% of patients, but if you could change the minds of maybe one or two or make them reconsider or make them think twice about something that they previously had another viewpoint of, you know, that to me is considered success. Uh, once again, it's such a pleasure to interview you and um, you're, you're something of like, <laughs> you know, a superhero in, in our community you know, so uh, just amazing. It's uh, still so impressive. You do so many podcasts, you know, a week. So, so incredible. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for coming on the Medical Entrepreneur Podcast. It's been a real honor. This is Dr. Kevin Fo, also known as Kevin MD. That's <laughs> what I always refer to as Kevin MD. Uh, and um, thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. Adam, thank you so much for having me.